My name is John Luke Waltrip, client number 1244 from Path of Miracles and Rob's Ranch. Uh, checked in here November, no, it would have been December the 3rd. Came in here, lost, broken, just as broke down as a man could be. Uh, thank God for Path of Miracles. Came in and intervened at my sister's house and, and uh, taught me into getting the help that I needed. Growing up as a kid, I grew up in western Oklahoma, small town. Grew up with whatever a kid want. You know, I had a great family, uh, great friends, small neighborhood. Uh, loved playing sports, but basketball was my love. Uh, couldn't ask for a better childhood. You know, great grandparents, just good family. Just had a had a good life. Uh, was taught about God at a young age. And, you know, I knew right from wrong. Uh, always that guy that was a little mischief, but uh, nothing too crazy. I uh, grew up quick, it seemed like. I always excelled in sports. Uh, I can kind of think about when things got, when I made a bad decision, was uh, going into my freshman year, I uh, was offered to smoke marijuana for the first time. and. Uh, I had drank a few times before that, but I had never experienced uh, the feeling I was about to have when I smoked marijuana. And I just remember uh, the feeling it gave me. You know, I got away from wherever I was at and it just uh, relaxed me. And uh, it seems like that was probably the beginning stages of my uh, drug addiction. Went through high school, um, played sports. We had a little group that you know, party, drank some, smoked, and I just experimented with marijuana all the way through high school. And I, thinking back, it really took an effect in my life. Like I just, uh, things started going downhill when I started using marijuana. Going into college, I was recruited to play at some smaller Christian schools. Uh, I knew there'd be drug tests going into there and I decided to go to another school that I had friends playing basketball and I was already experiencing with marijuana and it, it was really starting to affect my mind and I remember the day uh, I wasn't playing basketball anymore, you know, all my friends were still on the team, I wasn't and just the uh, guilt and shame I felt from just, you know, I'm. 18, 19 years old, and I, you know, I loved basketball. That's what I had worked my whole, you know, seemed like my life was basketball, and it was just pretty much took away because of my drug use. You know, it took me a while to realize that, but, you know, I just fell back so much from just, you know, putting that fog in my mind. And marijuana had led to uh, something I was going to experience. We all went to Mexico for a trip. Uh, Cancun and that's when I experienced what you would consider a hard drug and uh, I snorted cocaine for the first time and I remember doing it the whole trip we were up there and I just remember that first time I did it I, I realized what people were hooked on it for and I really liked it and I'll never forget we flew back out of Cancun and we didn't do any that day but as soon as we landed in Dallas my mind was thinking about cocaine I said, I know who I could probably call to get it. And, you know, I made that phone call and I remember doing cocaine in the States, you know, as soon as we got back and I just kind of in my mind, I knew it was probably a problem, you know, and um, I just always liked getting away from how I felt or um, I guess I just thought I liked the feeling of being high and it just led into more drugs, uh, just self-medicating myself with hard drugs and then I found myself taking prescription painkillers. I was hurt on a job and prescribed it and before I knew it, you know, I'm chewing up 20, 30, 40 lower tabs a day that led into Oxycontin. I was doing at the time what you consider doctor hopping. You know, I could go in there and talk to the doctor and get what I wanted. And at this time I was still working, uh, working my way up from the bottom just my way through the oil field in my job. I had worked uh, my way up to a supervisor position and I was abusing uh, painkillers daily and just to 
you know, it really wasn't to get high. It was just to get by, you know, when you didn't have the painkillers, you, you would be deathly sick, felt like you had the flu. So I was taking them a lot. I was shipped to Pennsylvania to work and to get by from coming off the pills, a friend had uh, told me about methadone and I was getting them from somebody else and I had took drug tests in the past with uh, it taking it and it didn't show up. <clears throat> but at uh, this time we were going on a big job and uh, they gave us 10 panel drug tests. And uh, I tested positive for methadone at the time. Um, my employer at the time uh, sat me down, told me I had to go to uh, rehab to keep my job. And I went to a 30 day treatment center and uh, really didn't take it serious. And during that time, it's thinking back, it's crazy, but I met my wife in rehab that I would end up marrying, you know, two years later. Uh, after I left rehab, I had about 10 months underneath my belt of sobriety. Uh, she had quit everything. And, uh, you know, looking in, it looked like everything was good. Uh, her and I ended up getting married about two years later. Uh, we had a beautiful, beautiful daughter. And uh, she had uh, what I consider my son at the time. I raised him at four years old. And uh, we looked like we had everything going on. She was clean. I was telling everybody I was clean, but I was still using, you know, prescription medicine to get through. Uh, we end up moving to um, New York. We buy a home, and I'm still working my way up in my career. And like I'm saying, everything looked good looking in, uh, but something she knew I had something going on. She knew I was still abusing, and uh, up there, prescription pain medicine is hard to, to get from doctors. They were starting to make a lot of laws, and I was introduced to heroin for the first time. Um, she didn't realize I was doing heroin. Uh, I wasn't IV in it, but I was using it daily, uh, eating it or snorting it. And uh, she couldn't really figure out what was wrong. Uh, friends knew something was wrong, but they just thought it was the pressure of my job. And I uh, just was an everyday drug user and just continued to use drugs. And I had an opportunity to come back to Oklahoma um, I thought I would go back to Oklahoma and get away from the drugs up there and move back to Oklahoma. Uh, had another little episode of clean time and seemed like it was doing good, but you know, I still had that, that monkey on my back. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a drug addict and I just put on a smile on my face every day like everything was good. And you know, everybody seemed like they loved me, but you know, I just, I didn't love myself. I was just in a bad place in my life and just didn't really know who I could go to or tell because you know, I had became dependent on drugs. Uh, had a lot of people I was over and just uh, felt like I couldn't talk to someone about it. And uh, started self-medicating again. Uh, my job performance went downhill quick. Um, Things was just kind of going down spiral and I didn't even really know it. I went ahead and uh, asked to leave my job to start another job that I knew I could get away from the drug test and be able to do as much drugs as I wanted to. And at that time, uh, my wife had started experiencing with drugs again. She had six years clean and she started using uh, methamphetamine and uh, it's something I didn't do, but as soon as I had left my job and started another job, I started dabbling with methamphetamine. And the I'd always been able to reel it in, I thought, but when I started doing meth, I just I couldn't put it down. Um, everybody around me knew something bad was going on. I put it on my wife that she's just going through a mental health, and I'm having to help with the kids, raise the kids, and you know I was just blaming everybody but me. And before I knew it, you know, I have, you know, my family's on me, you know, you know, something's going on. We need to know, can we help you? Can we do anything? And, you know, I just denied it. Uh, my son at the time asked if he could go live with his grandparents, uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law. He went there with them. And shortly after my daughter, 
Um, was at my parents' house and shortly after that she moved in with her brother with my mother-in-law and father-in-law. And that's when I feel like the drugs really got out of hand. Um, got the bright idea with some people one day to, that was IV and methamphetamine and I just remember him asking if I'd ever did it that way and I told him I, did, I was afraid of needles and uh, the person went ahead and uh, said he could do it for me just to turn my head and I'll never forget that day because from then on my life was totally down spiral out of control. When all this started I had a 715 plus credit score, home, vehicles, and I woke up one day and I am literally uh, sitting in a shop barn in a little bitty office with my wife uh, shooting methamphetamine. And it's kind of surreal to even talk about it right now because I never dreamed that a person could fall how quick we fell. Um, it's just, uh, I remember uh, New Year's Eve of uh, 2017, about to be 2018, telling my wife we have to get to the kids. You know, the kids are expecting us to be at the house. Her mom and dad expected us to be there. And I remember telling her we have to be there. <clears throat> and I wake up on Christmas Day at, at 4.30 in the afternoon. You know, I just went so hard and I woke up slunched down in a chair, needles all over the place. And you know, I've missed Christmas morning, Christmas Day, and it's another uh, broken promise to her family, to my family. And I can just remember sitting there and just wanting to die, you know. And the only thing a person can do and then is just, you know, take another shot, you know. And I, I remember doing it more and, you know, nothing could numb that feeling out anymore. I, I had got past that point of being able to numb myself out and I knew I was in deep trouble. I knew I was in trouble and I remember my dad telling me before this all started, he was like, son, if you can't reel yourself in what you got going on. I know he knew deep down what I had going on, but he just didn't know how to tell me. He's like, you're gonna lose everything you ever loved, everything. And he was so right. I had lost my kids, I was on my way to about lose my job. And like I said, I'm sitting in a, in a barn that is supposed to be my work facility to hold, you know, things for the job and I'm living in the back of the shop, you know, inside the little living quarters they had. And that was kind of the beginning of the end. Um, I went hard for another probably year almost of just drug use. And I can remember when it was coming to an end, I was in Gainesville, Texas. Uh, I was sitting in a motel room with my wife at the time and she's just in the bathroom, hot water running, you know, to try to warm your veins up or whatever and I'm sitting in there trying to find a vein in my leg and uh, I didn't have any veins in my arms because I just from the drug use and uh, I remember trying to do it in my leg and it just I missed and it swelled up and I just sat there and I just dropped everything and just you know prayed to God like what am I doing and I just cried out to God and prayed to him why do I keep doing this, God? Why do I keep turning to these drugs? Little did I know my family was working behind the scenes with Path to Miracles, Jeremy Gray, and my sister picked me up. And I'll never forget the words she told me as we were driving. She said, uh, she told me, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to continue to let you be in our life. And, uh, my brother was in the in the back seat and he said the same thing. He was just like, you can't keep coming in and out of our kid's life and then be in jail again. It's like, it upsets the whole family. 
And I just sat there kind of in awe that they were saying it because I was just couldn't believe it. And they were just so disappointed in me and uh, I was so disappointed in myself, just the guilt and the shame of I've done it again. And I remember getting to my sister's house. This would have been on uh, December 2nd, 2018. And she really didn't say much to me. And I remember I got in the shower and I just remember for some reason, Jeremy Gray's name was just on my mind because I knew Jeremy had some things going on and he had reached out to me a few times of coming to see him, to talk to me, and I just never could manage to get to him. And I don't know why he was on my mind, but I know God was working at this time. And I laid down, I went to sleep. I woke up to my sister kind of in a, in a panic. And I asked her, I said, don't tell me you are gonna try to have an intervention with me. Did you call a preacher? She's like, well, I called someone like the preacher. And I'm like, man, who is she called? And she's like, I called Jeremy Gray. And, you know, I kind of felt relieved there, but with the drugs coming out of my system, you know, I didn't know if he was the police or what he had going on, but I just remember telling my sister, I'll talk to Jeremy, but I'm not going to rehab. And so I cry myself to sleep and hope the devil I don't mean in the dreams that I So that's fine and I'll never forget Jeremy um, Jeremy and um, Dusty Ned and Jeff showed up at my house that night at my sister's house and sat there and let me talk my way into a trap and Jeremy just sat there and after I was done telling him that I was okay I could stop he asked me you know what are you willing to do to really stop and uh, I sat there for a sec and I told him, you know, I'll do anything. And uh, he got on the phone, made a call to Jake at Rob's Ranch right there in the living room. He told me I had to get my cell phone up. You know, I didn't have nothing but the clothes on my back at the time. And he took me in, you know, we went to Sober Living House. Um, they went and took me, got me some bathroom stuff clothes for the next day and uh, that morning you know I'm pulling into Rob's ranch and you know I've told people and said this a lot you know I pulled into Rob's ranch broke down I mean nobody ever realized how uh, how close I was ready to just check it in and, and be done with life if I didn't have my kids my wife was out there and her mess still and uh, I remember uh, Jeremy asking me, you know, he played a song and he said, if they uh, played this song at your funeral, what would your family say? And uh, it really hit home how close I was to death. But, you know, uh, my family still had a little faith in me and our faith in God. And, I remember Jeremy telling me, you know, hey, I believe in you. I think I think you can complete this program and I think you can start getting better. And Rob's Ranch did that for me. I just remember uh, checking into Rob's Ranch and uh, I just remember just being so just lost, crazy, you know, and I remember Tanner, my counselor, had that first assessment with me and uh, he stopped her. He's like, man, I got great news for you, John Luke. I was just like, what do you got, Tanner? He's just like, you're not crazy. He's just like, I am a professional trained counselor, and I can guarantee you you're not crazy. I was like, really? You know, everybody's talking about crazy. He says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get through all that. 
And you know, Tanner and I built a relationship that we have today and uh, a great relationship. And you know, he helped me work through the reasons why I use drugs. The hurt, the shame, the guilt, the reasons why I turned to drugs. That little prayer I prayed to God that day to show me why. And for 90 days, I had five counselors, you know, unbelievable men. Um, Bruce, Tanner, Brian, Mark, and Dennis. I mean, they'll be, have a place in my heart forever. You know, they, they uh, was a part of God's plan of breaking me down, tearing me down, and making, making me new again. And they did that. And uh, I'll have an extra special relationship with Tanner because we were just close. And, uh, I remember uh, I'd always tried to, I kept in touch with my kids daily, but my words had no meaning, nothing. And uh, I remember calling my mother-in-law, father-in-law. I mean, I give them so much thanks and gratitude, but I just talked to her in the beginning stages of getting here. And she's like, Luke, we'll just see how it plays out. You know, you've said a lot of things and your words don't mean much to us anymore, if anything. And, she didn't bring my daughter up to see me in the beginning, but I remember her bringing Layla May up here, you know, 40 days in, and uh, she told me she could see a change in me. And uh, she and I, her and I talked about some things, and you know, I've hurt her a lot, and the lies, and you know, they're they're raising my kids right now because of the decisions I made with my drug use. But uh, starting that day, I started building that relationship back with them. And uh, I remember the day I graduated or transitioned out of Rob's Ranch, uh, Path of Miracles were here, just like they were in the beginning. They were here to pick me up. And uh, Dusty, the house manager, really uh, expected a lot out of me. And I think I, in the beginning, I came in there and just, you know, really wanted to get kicked out. You know, I didn't think I needed sober living, but little did I know I needed it so much. And uh, they guided me through that first couple of months of transition and helped me and loved on me. But most of all, they loved me, but they held me accountable for everything that I was doing. And everything that this program, at Rob's Ranch, Path of Miracles, and you know, Jeremy told me about the promises that are gonna start coming true. My daughter and son are back in my life. Uh, when I tell Roma and Frank I'm gonna be somewhere to pick my kids up or pick Layla May up, I'm there. And you know, in the first, they were shocked. They just couldn't believe I was on time. Uh, told the kid, Layla May, I'm gonna be there, I'm there. And uh, I got to spend her birthday this weekend. Uh, she turned six years old on October 23rd, and uh, I wasn't there for that day, but we had a big party for her this weekend. And it's just those promises that have come true in my life. You know, I have a relationship with my family. My words have meaning. If I tell people I'm gonna do something, I do it. But uh, most of all, my relationship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is you know, I hate, it sounds crazy, but I'd give up anything for it, you know. It's, I'd give anything up for it, you know. He gave me a love, joy, and peace that only He can give. And, and you know, I give a, a lot of it being able to come out and transition into Path to Miracles, Sober Living House. And uh, it's just really helped me with accountability. Um, I've worked myself into where I'm one of the house managers, and it's just... It really helped me in the beginning stages of, you know, living sober and uh, not turning to drugs. And anybody out there that is thinking about it coming out, you know, sober living really helped me out a lot. Um, I'm just so full of gratitude today. And I just thank God so much that he put uh, Jeremy back in my life. You know, I knew Jeremy when he was younger, him and I did what kids do together and 
I seen Jeremy in a bad place in his life, but then I seen him in an unbelievable place when I was in my uh, addiction. And I just wanted what he had. I remember, you know, and just thinking, man, I wish I could get to there. And he gives a lot of hope for a lot of guys out there that's coming out of addiction. He gave me a lot of hope. I'm glad to call him a friend. Uh, I'm glad to be alumni of Rob's Ranch and uh, Path to Miracles. They'll be in my heart forever. You know, God is doing amazing things with that place, with the counselors, Doug, Linda, everybody involved, Lil J. I mean, it's just an unbelievable place, man. And it just, it, it makes me smile uh, just talking about it. When I come through the gate, I smile. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And last but not least, you know, I just want to thank my family, you know, for not giving up on me. A mom and dad that, that had a lot of faith in a, in a big God that we serve. And uh, my dad and mom said, you know, we had gave up on you, son, but we never once gave up on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And like I said, I found God again. And uh, something I never want to give up ever again. You know, I lived in darkness for a long time and you know, it feels good to, to be in the light. And uh, I just want my light to shine for others out there struggling and uh, bring this message that there is hope. There is a way to live sober and uh, have an unbelievable life. And that's what I seem like I have today. And I'm just full of gratitude and, Expect a miracle at Rob's Ranch. Uh, love everybody. Thank y'all.